Today, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to help you decide whether Panzer Corps II is the right World War II strategy game for you. By the end of this video, you will know what it's like to actually play this game to help you make an informed decision. Veterans of Panzer General or the original Panzer Corps game will already know what to expect, but for the uninitiated, give me 90 seconds to describe the game in a nutshell. If you're still intrigued after that, we'll go into more detail about the mechanics and what it's like to actually play the game. If you took the battle mechanics from 4X titles such as Civ 6 and merged them with the dynamic campaign mode from Call to Arms Gates of Hell Ostfront, you'd get Panzer Corps 2, a hex-based and turn-based strategy game set in World War II. You play as the Germans at various points in the war, commanding an impressive variety of tanks, infantry, planes and ships, with most missions requiring you to capture all control points on the map to progress. It isn't the case that tanks simply beat everything else. They rule the open terrain, but are decimated by infantry in close terrain, such as cities and forests. Entrenched infantry will need to be encircled and softened up by artillery bombardment before moving in. Most units stay with you and gain experience throughout the campaign and must be healed and upgraded between missions by spending prestige, which you obtain by capturing objectives. You also purchase new units and rotate old units to give you the right tools for the next mission. As each unit has strengths, weaknesses, and a limited number of moves per turn, it's like a game of chess where a single wrong move may be the difference between winning and losing that mission. The game was first released in March 2020, receiving overall positive reviews. After the success of the original Panzer Corps, the developer, Flashback Games Studios, went on to develop Warhammer 40k Armageddon before turning their attention to Panzer Corps 2. So, the developer does have a track record with this kind of game, and the game is well supported with future DLCs on the horizon. So let's pretend you've just purchased the game and fired it up. Let's see what the game looks like when you first log in. The first thing you'll notice is how slick the menu looks, which is a running theme throughout Panzer Corps 2. There are several tutorial missions which we'll look at in a moment, and you can see here we have several campaigns to choose from and a few individual scenarios to add to the mix too. Then under multiplayer we have Hot Seat, which is for multiple players at the same PC, and then of course online multiplayer, a map editor, and finally the usual options you would expect for video and audio etc. With first impressions out of the way, you're most likely going to look for the tutorial, which in Panzer Corps 2 is relatively long. There is a mini tutorial campaign with six stages to walk you through the basics, which may take up to an hour. There are also a few options that take you to YouTube videos on specific subjects, which are actually very useful. The tutorial isn't as expertly crafted as in Age of Empires 4, but it does a decent job of introducing you to the fundamentals of the game. A quick note on performance, if you play the original Panzer Corps on an old laptop that just about manages to run it, you may struggle as Panzer Corps 2 requires significantly more graphical oomph than its predecessor. But any vaguely modern system should be fine with this game on medium settings. As always, check the minimum system requirements. Now we know what the game's about, let's dive into more detail of what it's actually like to play the game. The battlefield in Panzer Corps 2 feels much like a board game, and the map size can vary from small to huge. You manoeuvre your pieces around a board where tanks and infantry can only attack when next to each other. Then you can preview the estimated result of an attack before making a decision. Artillery and planes can attack from range, and certain units will automatically defend others, such as fighter planes defending bombers and artillery defending ground units, but they have to be in the right place in order to do so. At the beginning of a campaign, you create a commander by selecting their strengths and weaknesses. You gain points by selecting weaknesses and spend them by selecting strengths, leading to some interesting combinations that can have a huge impact on how your campaign plays out. Your units gain veterancy as they progress, and you receive heroes at random throughout the course of a campaign who can be assigned to particular units. Heroes aren't that exciting, but they basically offer a bonus to a unit they're allocated to. Certain units come with special abilities. Some can be activated, such as Forced March, to increase movement distance, but some of the traits are passive, such as Fallschirmjäger being bunker killers. You can even split units to aid encirclements or merge them to declutter the battlefield. It's easy to understand each unit's individual abilities, but using these skills together to their full potential is complex and will take time to perfect. 
There's a variety of terrain, but fundamentally it can be broken down into three distinct types. Close terrain is good for infantry. Non-close terrain is good for tanks, but both receive penalties while sitting in a river. Minor rivers can be crossed, it just takes a full turn to do so, whereas larger rivers without a bridge do act as a barrier which requires a bridging unit to cross. Support units, such as artillery and bombers, don't deal much damage directly. Their job is to soften up a target before your tanks or infantry do the real damage. Infantry that are entrenched in a city can be a tough nut to crack, and attacking them with a tank would be suicide, but a couple of shots from artillery and a bombing run will reduce their entrenchments and increase their suppression, making them less effective when you send your own infantry in to dislodge them. These debilitating suppression effects only last for one turn. The unit refreshes itself, including fuel and ammo, at the beginning of each turn. But this leads us to another effective mechanic in this situation, encirclement. This is different to simply having multiple units next to an enemy to gain an attacking bonus. An encirclement is where you cut off a unit from its supply, meaning suppression builds, plus their ammo and fuel eventually runs out. So the ultimate aim in Panzer Corps 2 is to encircle units, soften them up with artillery, and then attack while they're highly suppressed and low on supplies. Weather conditions reduce the effectiveness of aircraft attacks or remove the ability to use aircraft completely for a turn or two. So keep an eye on the weather report at the top of the screen. Rain and snow can decrease the range units can move, but frozen rivers can be crossed more easily than flowing rivers. Once a unit loses its strength, you'll need to replenish it by spending prestige, which is earned in a few ways, but mostly by capturing objectives. At this point, you can choose to Elite Replace, which is a like-for-like -like experienced replacement, or simply Replace, which is cheaper, but replenishes the unit with less effective soldiers. You can also upgrade units with prestige. For example, you may upgrade infantry to include a truck so they can move further. You might upgrade a bomber, into a more powerful bomber, or you could overstrength a unit, which basically makes it more powerful, but it also takes up more space in your army. One of the main criticisms of Panzer Corps II is its lack of depth compared to similar strategy games. For example, the supply system is just kind of there, automatically taking care of itself in the background. That's fine if you're not looking for that kind of depth, but a Hearts of Iron experience, this is not. The bulk of the single player content is in the campaign tree. As you progress through the campaign, you're presented with choices providing different scenarios with a different style of play. Sometimes these decisions will take you down a different part of the tree, dictating which parts of the war you'll experience, with a bit of alternative history thrown in there for flavour. There are also different starting points on the same tree, resulting in a lot of duplication within the campaigns. Then we have the individual scenarios, which are pretty self-explanatory. Under multiplayer, you'll find random skirmish with up to eight players, which is one of your only opportunities to play as either USA, Soviets, or Great Britain. Hot Seat is multiplayer with friends taking turns on the same computer. We then have the interestingly named PBEM++ mode, which is another way of saying online multiplayer. Then finally, we have a detailed map designer for those who want to design their own scenarios. Let's blast through some final high-level matters before looking at the prices and DLC options. Does the game have a lot of micromanagement? This is a resounding yes, with very little automation. Every single move comes down to you. There's no base building in this game. In typical World War II fashion, your units are busy running or driving around the map trying to encircle and outnumber the enemy. If you want to build a fortress, you're in the wrong place. Resource management is minimal. You have one resource, as we've mentioned before, and rather than earning more of it, the trick is to not take damage or lose units unnecessarily, so you don't have to spend it. There is a limit to how big your army can be, so juggling that can be a bit of a challenge. At the beginning of a match, the game will highlight where you can deploy units, and you're pretty restricted in your options. Aircraft can only be deployed to an airfield, and transferred between airfields you control, but their range is large. Once you've started the game, it is possible to deploy new units, but only from a limited number of hexes. Wheeled units travel faster by road, and it is possible to transport most units large distances by train, sea, and air if you control the relevant stations, docks, and airfields. 
Each unit has a large number, indicating their remaining health and fighting effectiveness. The dots below this is their ammunition, and the red and green represents their ability to move and shoot, which most units can only do once per turn. There's even an undo button on the right hand side, which can be used to reverse a misclick or cheat a little bit and simply change your mind when you make a bad attack. The strategy gods may judge you for doing this, but the settings are fully customizable if you only want to use it for certain actions or cap the number of times it can be used. The units themselves are detailed and there are a heck of a lot of them, plus you can capture enemy equipment if you make them surrender, which is a nice touch. You can even change the camo skins of individual units with an impressive array of choice, useful if you want to identify a hero unit easily. The unit models aren't as lovingly crafted as in Steel Division 2 or Gates of Hell Ostfront, but if you like your World War II hardware or various infantry divisions, there is a lot for you to love in this game. Looking at the AI, firstly, how does the difficulty scale work? Elite replacements are free at the easiest level. Your prestige gain and turn limit decrease at higher difficulty levels, and the AI's base accuracy increases at the higher levels. It's a decent scaling system where it doesn't feel like the AI is just cheating, and you can set yourself specific challenges from a preset list to further spice things up. But does the AI fight differently at higher levels? It does focus fire more effectively to kill off your units. It will go on less suicide runs, and will occasionally encircle you, though it's hard to tell if that is intentional or by chance. I've not seen the AI use any of the unit abilities, but it is fairly aggressive, even at the lower difficulty levels, to resist your attempts at encirclement. Overall, the turn count is the real enemy instead of the mediocre AI. I'm pretty sure it's bombed me through the fog of war a few times, and it's particularly poor at being an ally. But this will only be a concern to experienced players. If you're new or a casual player of the genre, the AI is fine. By default, the game does have some RNG. You might do one less damage than predicted, for example, but nothing like the painful RNG of XCOM or Steel Division 2. You can even adjust this in the randomness setting from 0% to 100% RNG, though we finally have the fuck you RNG setting we've always wanted, but it isn't a big feature of the game. The sound effects and the music are both okay, not bad, not good, so we won't dwell on those. There's an impressive level of zoomage, and if you zoom out enough, you get a different tactical map view, which is useful for the larger maps. Before we look at prices and DLC, let's take a moment to discuss the longevity of the game. There are a decent number of missions in the base game's campaign tree, although the mission objectives are generally the same. It's fun to approach the same mission in a different way, with a different army, and the choices throughout the campaign mean it will be a while before you end up playing the same missions in the same order. The lack of depth compared to other strategy games, such as the automated supply system, will likely cause hardened veterans to move on after a few runs through the campaign. Now you know what it is you're buying, let's take a look at the price they're trying to charge you for the game. The normal cost of the base game is $40, £31 or €34, Euros, but recently they've started discounting the game by 50%, bringing the sale price down to $20, £15.50 or €17, Euros, which is a bit of a bargain. The game is also available on Xbox Game Pass for those who subscribe to that, and for $15 there is a general edition upgrade for the game, which includes four additional scenarios and a few other bonus bits. The DLCs start with the Spanish Civil War in a 16 scenario campaign, the next DLC is simply called Axis Operations 1939, the next is 1940, and so on. Each time you purchase a new DLC, you can carry over your army from the previous DLC to continue the fight, in approximately 15 to 20 new scenarios per DLC. It's a cool concept, but at $10 per DLC, even with the regular 30% discount, it gets expensive real quick. There is also a newly announced DLC for the Pacific, which looks interesting, but there isn't much detail on that yet. The game does say it's a big fan of the mod scene, but looking on the Steam Workshop, there aren't many mods compared with other games. But with that said, the game is still relatively young in mod terms, and there are several that provide new missions or units if you don't like the look of the DLCs, 
but want some more Panzer Corps too. So let's answer the question, is the game worth it for you today? Panzer Corps 2 is a well-oiled machine. It's easy to pick up the basics, but when you have several units on the board, all with different strengths and weaknesses, it really is like a game of chess. Easy to learn the basic moves, but that doesn't mean you're ready to take on a Grand Master. If you're already a fan of turn-based World War II hex-based games, then you may find the lack of depth, such as a simplistic supply system, doesn't adequately challenge you. But the game is full of small quality of life details, such as being able to make a note on each save to help you recall details. It's a well thought out and quality product. Those who are new to the genre or more casual gamers will find Panzer Corps 2 is a decent entry point. If you're considering a sidestep from RTS games, those who play the dynamic campaign mode from Ostfront, for example, or those who play other turn based games such as XCOM, will find the basics of movement and unit management surprisingly familiar. And for those who found Hearts of Iron 4 just a little bit too overwhelming, may find a more manageable World War II experience with Panzer Corps 2. If you are a potential Panzer Corps 2 player, please feel free to ask me questions in the comments. And if you found this video useful, I have plenty of other strategy and World War II content, so please consider checking those out too. If you are a veteran of the game, thanks for watching and please share your thoughts and corrections in the comments below. They're always welcome. See ya.